and hello. I'm Edith Vanderwater. Edith Weir Vanderwater. I'm here to talk about our family. You can see our monument behind me. The one with the white flowers. There are five of us buried up there. My husband's parents, my husband, me, and our daughter. My husband was Charles Vanderwater. He was born in New York in 1872. His father was a Methodist minister there. I was born in Ohio in 1874. My father was a farmer. <coughs> he died when I was a teenager, and a few years later, my mother moved the family to Tennessee. That's where I met Charles. He was at college there, a Methodist college, Tennessee Western. In 1904, we were married, and a few years later, we moved here to Long Beach. The city was growing, and to Charles, that was the golden opportunity. He opened the Charles Van Water Company selling real estate and insurance. He and his partner, Stephen Townsend, are credited with the growth of Long Beach, Los Angeles, and parts of Orange County. Charles had his causes. One of them was water. He proposed a park in Signal Hill that would help control flooding and collect water for irrigating crops. Unfortunately, the city was more interested in developing its shoreline, and his idea never got traction. Another of his causes was the city's port. He went to Washington, D.C. to lobby for federal money to help with its development. That worked out better than the park idea. Oh, I had my causes, too. I was a member of the Ebel Club. We helped campaign for women to get the right to vote in 1911. Charles was a suffrage supporter. I made sure of that. <laughs> As busy as we were, we still managed to find time to have four children. Eleanor, Charles Jr., Janice, and John. Sadly, Eleanor died of meningitis just before her 10th birthday. Like most Californians, Charles and I were ardent Republicans. He wanted a larger role in politics, so in 1920, he ran to represent Long Beach in the U.S. Count Congress. And he won. A few weeks later, 250 people gathered in Pomona to celebrate his win. Toasts and tributes glowed. Charles told the crowd that he felt nearer to heaven than ever before. <laughs> we had no idea how true that would be. Just after midnight, we got in the car to go home. Charles was driving, and his secretary was sitting in the front seat. My best friend, Nina Jackson, and I were in the back. The road was very dark. Suddenly, we were blinded by headlights coming right at us, and Charles swerved to the right, but nobody saw the stalled truck by the side of the road. The impact killed Charles and his secretary instantly. Nina and I were taken to the hospital and sedated. The next morning, the doctor broke the horrifying news. Our pastor went to tell Charles' 92-year-old father that his son was dead. I dreaded telling the children. They had already lost a sister, and now their father was never coming back. I'm not sure how much the two youngest understood, but Charles Jr. was 10. He knew what it meant. My husband had left us financially stable, so I didn't have to worry about money. Still, our family would never be the same. I, I was worried about Charles Jr. I encouraged him to join the Boy Scouts. I hoped that the troop leaders would be role models for him. In 1925, land in Idlewild was donated to the troops for a new camp. They built a beautiful lodge. It was surrounded by trees and nature, the perfect place to let boys and their imagination run wild. That December, with the lodge barely completed, my son was one of 15 honor scouts invited to the first winter camp. The boys were called snow, long hikes, and a warm hearth to gather around in the evening. Well, you know how boys are. They decided to form a club to cement their friendship. Their mission was to promote and staff the new camp. They spent the next two days coming up with a name for their group and writing a constitution. They decided to call themselves the Tribe of Talkwits after a nearby mountain. Today, the Tribe of Talkwitz is an official organization in the Long Beach Area Boy Scout Council. Membership is by invitation. Scouts must meet the requirements, including camping experience and two merit badges. And my son was one of the founders. How about that? 
I was a good mother, but I wasn't so involved with my children's lives that I didn't have a life of my own. My guiding principle was, motherhood is an occupation, not a prison. <laughs> I served two terms as the president of the Eval Club. In 1924, I was head of the committee that oversaw the construction of its impressive building. I also served as board president for the Long Beach YWCA. Sadly for <coughs> in Long Beach, the YWCA building is gone. And the Ebel Club breathed its last breath as an organization in 2013. The building is now used for weddings and events. Times change. Although my husband was gone, I remained active in politics. It was a passion that lasted my entire life. I served as pre oh no, I was one of the founding members of the California Federation of Republican Women, and I served as president for 10 years. In 1933, we held a big meeting with all the regions attending. Ethel Case, the wife of Walter Case, the Press Telegram's editor, was the secretary. Well, I asked her to present the minutes. She informed me that she didn't take notes and had no minutes to present. She then told the group that her main job as secretary was driving me around to buy lipstick and attend speaking engagements. I suspect she told her husband about it because the whole conversation ended up in the newspaper. My secret was out. Yes, I wore lipstick to all my speaking engagements. Thank you, Ethel, for letting everyone know. <laughs> the next year, the 1934 California governor's race was one I'll never forget. Political scientists and historians still talk about it. You've all heard of Upton Sinclair, haven't you? Well, you might remember his book, The Jungle. Well, he always took the side of the people and never the side of big money. In California, he decided to run for governor as a Democrat. <laughs> He advocated programs that sounded like socialism, or even communism to Republicans like me. Oh, we were scared. Frank Marion, the Republican candidate, was from Long Beach, and I worked hard in his campaign. Of course, I was small potatoes compared to his other supporters, including Louis B. Mayer, the head of MGM Studios, and William Randolph Hearst, the media tycoon, and Harry Chandler, the publisher of the Los Angeles Times. They rallied together to create a Stop Sinclair campaign. <laughs> Hearst and Chandler filled their newspapers with articles and editorials demonizing Sinclair. People read the newspapers back then and believed what they reported. But even more damaging than the newspapers was Mayer turning his studio into a propaganda machine. He turned out fake newsreels that played in theaters before the movie started. The newsreels were filled with lies intended to scare people. And it worked. Merriam won. That race was a turning point in modern elections because of how popular media was used to demonize one candidate and promote the other. To be honest, looking back, I'm a bit embarrassed by it. But at age 82, I was still campaigning. In 1958, I pinned a chrysanthemum on Bill Nolan when he ran for governor but he lost to Pat Brown. And that was the end of Republican domination of California politics. <laughs> in 1961, my life came to an end, and I joined the Vandewater family here in Sunnyside. Thank you all for spending time with me today and for supporting the Historical Society of Long Beach.